Hi, my name is Dr. Tammy Nemeth, and I host a podcast called the Nemeth Report Podcast. And I also am a participant of the Energy Transition Podcast, which is an international group of energy experts, I suppose you could call us. And we talk every week about the various issues going on in the energy transition space um, in the world. So pretty interesting stuff. That's a really good point about um, how the plastics ban that they that they put in there is quite broad and general on the Canadian Environmental Protection Act list of toxic substances. It just says manufactured plastic products with no distinction of which ones. So they banned the first six things, which is plastic straws and plastic bags and those little disposable things. But with the way the definition is, it could very well mean all manufactured plastic items, which means baby bottles, it means things that women rely on in order to look after the children. If you think of what a, a baby stroller is made out of, what other items that a baby uses, the teething rings, all those different things, well, that's all made of plastic. So based on the toxic substance list that the that federal government has, those things could be banned. The 1.5% of the emissions is a really important point because the way I try to think of it is, there's an entire ocean out there and we contribute a little eyedropper into that ocean. And meanwhile, China is dumping in cement truck after cement truck into that ocean. What we contribute is so minuscule. And when you think of what, how much CO2 is in the atmosphere, it's 0.04%. It's almost nothing. And, and we're contributing 1.5% of what humans cause, not, not what's out there, because nature actually um, has CO2 as well. So, and the carbon tax, the way it works is, it really just punishes people. It doesn't solve anything. What, what's it meant to do? It's meant to stop us from using anything that produces CO2. So how is that helping the global environment when we produce 1.5%, and it is all mixed into the atmosphere and China produces almost 30% and they're building more and we're, we're not. I have a PhD in history and my research was on Canada, US oil and gas policy. And so I analyzed how Canada and the United States made their decisions about um, the oil and gas trade and development within their jurisdictions and how we affected each other. And from there, I taught at a university in Germany, published some academic articles and you know when I see what's happening with the energy transition these are really bad policy decisions what it will do is lead to less prosperity for people and makes it very difficult for us to have the type of lifestyle and standard of living that our parents and grandparents fought for so to me this is a real existential issue in the sense of keeping our civilization going and and having the kind of life that, that our parents wanted for us. A lot of it becomes a matter of energy literacy. And not just energy literacy, but literacy in how things work and operate and how we get things from the store. My understanding is that there are some initiatives in Alberta that um, help teach kids where food comes from. There's little gardens, they plant stuff, they see how things grow. It's one way, at least I think it's a pilot project, that could maybe be introduced um, into, into urban areas. It's definitely something that, that we need to work on and try to bridge that gap of knowledge. Indigenous people are like, like everybody else. There's people who support things and there's people who don't. And within the Indigenous community, there's those who completely support um, energy development because they see it as a way to get themselves out of poverty, create jobs within their communities, to have a prosperous <clears throat> lifestyle and standard of living. And then there's other indig Indigenous people who don't like that. And I think sometimes this is something that needs to be settled within the Indigenous community on how, how best to go about perhaps making bridges there to, to say, look, we, we would all like to have a prosperous lifestyle and still look after the environment and still have clean air and clean water. And I think the indigenous um, energy development does that. Just the same as the um, 
non-Indigenous development is also concerned about having clean air, clean water, and ensure that the land isn't um, destroyed. So if we can embrace that kind of storytelling, that the industry isn't just about producing this incredibly vital resource, but we do it in such a manner that we look after and make sure that the land is, is taken care of, the air is clean and the water is clean, then I think that can go a long way to bridging um, gaps with people who don't understand the industry. Unfortunately, it would seem that the Trudeau government, the Liberal NDP coalition, is completely following the lead of Europe. And I've lived there, and it's a disaster. Everything is very expensive. Energy is unreliable. The German government gave permission to the, the power companies to shut off the electricity to houses that have heat pumps and EV chargers. So what that will mean for the people in Germany who have been forced into buying heat pumps will be an interesting development. I don't know how the citizens are going to react to that. But Justin Trudeau and the Liberal NDP coalition want us to do the same thing in Canada. Switch everything to a heat pump and then the grid can't handle it. And then what do you do? Well, you have to take care of the grid. And that means cutting people off of their energy. So why they're doing that, I don't know. You, I think you'd have to ask them. Um, but they seem to be following what the Europeans are doing and, and, and that is part of this larger movement to sort of fulfill whatever was agreed at the Paris 2015 meetings where they signed the Paris Agreement. And they're all, all the Western countries are trying to fulfill those uh, pledges that they made. Of course, they're just pledges. We don't have to do it. And I really think they should be reconsidering what they're doing. You can find me on Twitter at The Nemeth Report. I also am on LinkedIn under T. Nemeth. Check out my podcast. It's at thenemethreport.com. And I have links to my publications, the op-eds, and the other um, projects that I work on.